Um, I'm, I'm Jennifer Hoppe. I'm the executive director of the Fort Tryon Park Trust. Uh, we're the park conservancy that partners with the New York City Parks Department in the um, revitalization of, of Fort Tryon Park, which is a scenic, one of 10 scenic landmarks in all of New York City and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the Fort Tryon Park Conservancy works uh, hand in hand with the Parks Department um, the Parks Department, I'd say, does the majority of the work for the park, and then we fill in the gaps. Um, that means additional staff for maintenance and horticulture. That means we fund uh, repairs to, you know, the nine miles of historic retaining walls. We raise the $48,000 to inoculate the 100-year-old elm trees. We provided the last $350,000 uh, for Javits Playground. Uh, so we do park improvements, staffing. We also help facilitate a pretty robust stewardship program. And last but not least, um, we add vitality to the park through dynamic public programs, um, whether they're natural history, fitness, um, cultural festivals, um, activating the park and engaging its, its diverse constituency and helping build community. Um, so it's our delight today uh, to have Leslie Day, um, a naturalist and the author of many uh, field guides to New York City, street trees, birds, uh, nature uh, in New York City. And her most recent book is The, the Honeybee Hotel. Um, so pick up a copy. Um, and today she is gonna be talking to us about the wildlife, the abundant wildlife we have in Fort Tryon Park's uh, 67 acres. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, hopefully you've encountered a lot of these uh, animals on your walks through the park. And if you haven't, now you know uh, for your next visit what to look for and how they're making it through the winter. Um, if you're just joining us now, um, just so that everyone has the benefit of hearing Leslie during the talk. Um, as questions come up, if you could put them in the chat and then we'll field them at the end. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if you haven't ever been a part of uh, one of the workshops that the Fort Tryon Park Trust puts on, um, they're an absolute delight, um, especially when they're led by Leslie, um, who's knowledgeable, passionate and um, not only talks about the park and teaches us about the park, but she helps tend the park. Uh, she's one of our star volunteers uh, in the Heather Garden. So it's, uh, it's my honor to turn it over now to Leslie Day. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, uh, we spoke a, a few weeks ago about how plants survive winter. And at that time it hadn't snowed yet. And I said, will we ever have a real winter again? And you know, the last week we've gotten probably 20 inches of snow. Um, but plants and animals are completely entwined. They depend upon each other for life. So what they each do for, during the winter has an impact on each other. Um, There are many animals that stay here year round. Some of them are active and, and don't hibernate and are able to find food every day. Like, oh, someone just drew on, someone just drew. You need to stop doing that. Let me see if I can, or erase it. Oh, thank you, perfect. Um, so we have songbirds that stay like the Northern Cardinals. Um, and we have car raptors, carnivorous birds, like the red-tailed hawk. And I just found out that there's a red-shouldered hawk that's been hanging around Margaret Corbin Circle. And they are also enormous hawks. Um, we have owls, like the barred owl. And I'll tell you about that. Um, and we have insects that overwinter, like the morning cloak butterfly and the queen bumblebee. Um, we have so many such diversity of, ma of mammals in this park, more than any other park, I think, in, in Manhattan, except for Inwood Hill Park. So I think the Northern Manhattan parks are where you will be able to see skunks and, and woodchucks or groundhogs. 
And to my absolute delight this year, I discovered that we have Southern flying squirrels and I will tell you all about them. But um, for 40 years, my, my husband and I lived on a houseboat at the 79th Street Boat Basin. And I would see um, raccoons once in a while and of course, gray squirrels, but I never saw a skunk there and I never saw a, um, a groundhog there. So Daniel, you have to stop drawing it, thank you. <laughs> So these are some of the animals that are able to stay, but many animals have to leave and they have to leave because they just can't find the food that they need. So birds don't have to leave because it gets cold because birds have under their outer feathers are down feathers, just like the feathers that are in our down parkas that keep us warm. So birds can stay warm. They just can't find the food. They can't find the insects that they need or the fruit or the flowers. The osprey is a bird that feeds on fish. It can't find the fish in the winter because the fish also migrate in the winter. And there are insects that migrate. Um, butterflies and bugs and beetles migrate. And of course, the ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, and so here are some of the birds that migrate. They cannot find food. Um, the magnolia warbler, the ruby-throated hummingbird that has to have nectar from flowers. And of course the butterflies do too. This is a painted lady butterfly that migrates. The gray catbird here is feeding a blackberry or a mulberry to her babies. They have to migrate because they need, also need fruit. And hoverflies migrate. So I'll be going into all of that. When you look at this map, which was designed by New York City Parks Natural Resources Group to show where all the forever wild places are in the parks. And those are places where they'll never build a playground or a ball field, where they leave everything wild for the plants and the animals. But if looking down on New York City on Staten Island and Manhattan and the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens, you're, you're seeing what the birds see when they fly over and they're coming up a route that ornithologists call the Atlantic Flyway. And it's the route that birds take from their Southern feeding grounds in the winter to their Northern breeding, breeding grounds in the summer, in the spring and the summer, where they will nest and raise their young. And then in the autumn, the migration is reversed and they take that same route, the Atlantic Flyway, to go from their northern breeding grounds to their southern feeding grounds, sometimes thousands of miles away. They have to be able to find food. So some of the warblers that are now, some of the birds that are now gone, the migrants, um, are the warblers. They're tiny, colorful birds with tweezer-like beaks because they feed on insects. They're insectivores. And right now it's really hard to find in active insects in the park. There are a few, but not many. So there's the yellow warbler. Here's the magnolia warbler. The, many of the warblers um, uh, schedule, the time that they arrive in the spring is time to when the eggs laid by moths hatch on leaves and caterpillars emerge in the spring. Gazillions of caterpillars and the, mi the migrating warblers come in and feed on them. This is a black-throated blue warbler. And these are all birds that you can see in our park. This is the, Amer the male American red start, the um, yell common yellow throat, and there's a pair that I see all the time in the heather garden because they are pretty much ground nesting birds. They, they nest low in shrubs. The black and white warbler, which you often see on the trunks of trees. The most gorgeous, the prothonotary warbler, which is named for the, the clerks in the Catholic church, uh, the prothonotaries that wore these golden robes. The Northern Parula warbler, and the yellow rump warbler. Now, if we had, if we had wax myrtle shrubs, they produce these waxy berries in the winter that 
these particular warblers can live on. So if we had them, these warblers would also stay during the winter. You can find them out in Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. You can find them in Riverside Park with Riverside Park South where they planted the wax myrtle. And the oven bird, which is a warbler that spends a lot of time on the ground hunting for ants and grubs and beetles and termites under the leaf litter. We also have the flycatcher, the, the Eastern Phoebe, and you know them because they say Phoebe, 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 and they flick their tails up and down and they fly from a perch and, and, and catch insects on the wing. We have a couple of species of woodpeckers who migrate because they can't find their food here in the winter. And one of them is the Northern Flicker. And the Northern Flicker is, finds its um, insects on the ground. It hammers the soil with that long, strong bill and to get to worms and beetles and ants, but they nest in trees. And now here's a bird that is considered a keystone species. And that means that other animals rely on it and this is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Yellow-bellied sapsucker is a small woodpecker that comes up here in late winter, early spring, just when the sap is rising inside the trees. Remember a few weeks ago when I said deciduous trees lose their leaves in winter, in, in early winter, late fall, and they store all the sugar that the leaves have produced in their roots. Well, come, the end of winter, the beginning of spring, that sugar, that sap starts to move back up the tree to the leaf buds so the leaves can open and then make their own food. Well, this little sap sucker comes up and starts to hammer holes in a ring around the tree, <clears throat> accessing that sap. So these are called sap wells. And although there aren't a lot of insects around, the sap sucker then will drink the sap which is a source of sugar, of fuel, and insects that are around will go to drink the sap and get stuck in it, and then the woodpecker will eat those insects. But all kinds of other animals come to that to those sap wells. Uh, morning cloak butterflies come there, and ruby-throated hummingbirds. In fact, the ruby throat is known to time its migration along with the yellow-bellied sapsucker because before the flowers bloom, the hummingbird needs sugar. And so it goes to, here's a male. You can't see the ruby throat on this one because the sun isn't hitting it. So it looks like it's all black, but if the sun were to hit it, it would be orange red. But it's going to one of the sap wells to get sugar water. And here it is at a fall blooming plant, the cardinal plant. Another migrating bird, and these are tiny, are the kinglets, the ruby crown and the golden crown. And they come in in late March and they, they love to eat insect eggs, and tiny insects. They're, they're maybe three or four inches. They're, they're so small and beautiful. And then there are the omnivores that migrate that can't stay here in the winter, but are very common in the spring and the summer and the fall. And here's the gray catbird eating termites that have just hatched out, but they eat a lot of fruit. Fruit, are not, fruit is not available in the winter. <clears throat> and the Eastern towhee. And these are all birds you'll see in our park. And of course the red-winged blackbird and the Baltimore Oriole. Now the Baltimore Oriole is named for Lord Baltimore who founded the colony of, of the British Lord who founded Maryland, um, the colony of Maryland. And they named this bird after Lord Baltimore because of the colors in the crest. Well, most Orioles leave in the wind before the winter. They feed, they love flower buds of the cotone ester and they love fruit and insects and they leave. But this winter, a female Oreo has been coming to our feeder, here she is, and the feeder of my neighbor up on the eighth floor of our building, Tom. And we don't know why she stayed, um, but she eats suet and she eats seeds and Tom put out grape jelly and she's been eating that. So that is a real treat to have her here in the winter and to be able to feed her. 
And then there's this very interesting bird called the brown-headed cowbird that is a bird of the Midwest. And it evolved with the buffalo um, and would sit on the buffalo's back and move along with the buffalo and eat the insects that the buffalo would scrape up with his, with his hoofs. Um, the brown-headed cowbird does not build her own nest. She lays her eggs in the nests of other birds. She, she never stops to build a nest. She just, she's like a little nomadic bird moving along and feeding and laying eggs in other birds' nests. And here she is. They came to my feeder this fall too. Here's the male. And here's one of her eggs in the nest of a robin. Now, most birds will raise the young of the cowbird, but robins are really smart. And they look at that egg and they toss it out. Another gorgeous omnivore is the scarlet tanager. There were so many in the Heather Garden uh, and in Fort Tryon Park this past spring, but they also are omnivores eating fruit and insects. And the red-breasted grosbeak. This is the male. They leave too. And then we have the birds that stay with us year round. Let me just get rid of this floating, hide floating meeting shows. Good. So the house sparrow is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. Um, the house sparrow and the European starlings were brought here when someone decided that they wanted to see every bird that Shakespeare mentioned in his, in his works. And so they released the house sparrow and they released starlings in the Shakespeare Garden in Central Park in like 150 years ago. And of course now there are billions of them and they're everywhere and they're here to stay. Uh, but they are wonderful birds. They mate for life. They're fantastic and loyal mates and wonderful parents and they eat everything. They are omnivores. Um, house finches. They, the males have little red heads and, and red tail feathers. I took this picture on the right this morning. Um, they were at the feeder um, and they were, <laughs> this is the female and this is the male. The American goldfinch is here year round. In the summer, they, they are brightly colored, especially the males are bright yellow and black and white, but their winter plumage is very dull. So they don't stand out. They don't wanna be eaten by hawks. Um, they feed on tree seeds and flower seeds and are able to find food year round. American robins sometimes do stay in the winter. I haven't seen any this winter, maybe some of you have, but they're all in the warm seasons, they feed mostly on worms, other insects, but in the winter, they're able to feed on, on berries and survive. These are hawthorn berries. And of course, our blue jays, the Eastern blue jay, who here is feeding on um, staghorn sumac berries. And another crested beauty is the cedar waxwing, who all summer long, um, it's almost like a flycatcher catching insects in midair, uh, but in the winter it feeds on berries and it's also feeding on hawthorns. And they, during the courting of a male and a female, they, they do this little dance, which I'm going to show you now. <laughs> This is the cedar waxwing. Found in Guelph year round, this bird can be identified by its red wax winged tips and the crest on its head. What makes this bird so special is its side hop courtship behavior, which is part of how it finds and keeps a mate. A male attracts a female by passing a small item back and forth, such as a fruit, an insect, or a flower petal as a gift. The male would hop towards the female, pass the item, and then hop out. Then the female would hop in, pass the item, and then hop out. <laughs> this dance, as some may call it, would continue until the female eats the gift. Look out for this type of behavior the next time you see a cedar wax ring. Other birds that are here year round are these three species of woodpeckers. The red-bellied, which is the largest woodpecker we have. Um, I, there are pileated woodpeckers in, in Westchester, but I don't know 
Fenny had been seen in the city in a while. They are enormous woodpecker, but the red-bellied is also quite large and the downy is our smallest. Now, these three are the males, um, the downy and the hairy, which looks just like the downy, but is larger and has a much longer bill, have these little red caps. The females don't, they have little white caps. Um, and the red bellied male has a red like a mohawk all the way down to its beak and the female doesn't. But they're able to find food. Um, they're able to find overwintering grubs and insects under the bark. And of course they'll come to feeders and they particularly love suet. The Northern Mockingbird spends all year here too. And in the winter feeds on all kinds of berries. So um, the Northern Cardinal is a very, very favorite bird of mine. Um, this is a picture I took last Monday in that big snowstorm. The Cardinals don't come to my feeder very often, but it seems every time it snows, they do. So they were here again this morning, but here it looks like the male is feeding the female. And the morning dove, the beautiful morning dove, it has this blue, ring around their eyes. They come to my feeder every day and they stay for hours. And the pigeon, I know a lot of people don't like them, but they are remarkable birds. They also mate for life. They produce this protein rich fluid called crop milk that they feed their babies. Um, they're incredibly intelligent birds and loyal birds and they've served humanity uh, for thousands of years, uh, delivering messages and wars, and um, and they fed humans for thousands of years also. Red tail hawks. Um, Jennifer was saying that a, a red tail was rescued last week in Fort Tryon Park and was taken to the Wild Bird Fund. So if you find an injured bird, there's a wonderful organization on Columbus Avenue uh, between 87th and 88th Streets called the Wild Bird Fund. I mean, they take in turtles, um, they, they take in all kinds of animals. They have a full hospital there. And if they can, they'll save the animal and they release it. So that this red tail, the red tail hawk they say, uh, they think had a head injury and they took to the wild bird fund. Now the barred owl, um, I, I think it was early December, I was visiting a neighbor and I was coming home on Broadway um, by Bennett Avenue uh, where I live. And I turned into my building and I was thinking about something and then I heard, this sound, I heard it over and over. At first I thought it was a car because it was Broadway. And then I realized, I stopped and I said, that sounds like an owl. And I looked up and two barred owls flew over my head into Fort Tryon Park. We're right across the street from the park, from the lower park. Oh my God, I was just so thrilled. And I'm never out at night anymore, never, never, never. So it was a really wonderful, happy circumstance, but these are huge owls and we've heard them since. Well, my husband's heard them. My hearing isn't so great anymore, but he's heard them. So they're here and they're active at night. And then the European starling, also not a, so much of a love bird. However, the starling is a really smart bird. And in, long ago in England, they were called the poor man's dog, because if you raise them, they'd follow you everywhere and you can teach them to talk. And in my next slide, I'm going to show you, and I told you that starlings were first released in Central Park in the Shakespeare Garden. So these people found a starling somewhere maybe in Wisconsin. And um, no, none of the wildlife rehabilitators would take it. So they decided to raise it themselves and they decided to teach it to speak about the history of starlings in the United States. So let's have a listen. I, I don't wanna go here. I don't wanna start at the very beginning. So they raise this little bird, teach it to eat on its own.
So they wanted to teach it a little history, why it was introduced. European starling. Okay, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> um, pretty amazing, right? They, they have an incredible syrinx and they're actually be able to sing and harmonize with themselves. So they really are remarkable birds. In late fall, a whole different crew of birds come down to the city. These are the winter visit visitors. The uh, black-capped chickadee in here is eating uh, staghorn sumac berries and the white-breasted nuthatch, the white-throated sparrow, the tufted titmouse, and the dark-eyed junco. They all come down and spend the winter and sometime in February, early March, they move back up north. Now I wanna talk about migrating insects and the insects that stay here year round. So the monarchs all leave at the same time. Um, this picture was taken in the Heather Garden uh, where there were so many monarchs covering these asters. And this was in October. I don't remember what year I took this photograph. But monarchs make this very long journey from our state and along the whole Eastern seaboard to Southern Mexico where they spend the winter. And then in late February, early March, they begin the return trip. The first group leaves and they go to Texas. And there they mate and lay eggs and after a while they die. And then their babies move on and go to the south. And then they lay their eggs and die. And then that next generation comes up to us, the third generation. And then they mate and lay their eggs and live for a while and die. But the fourth generation starts the migration all over again. Another insect that migrates are the milkweed bugs. They, they also feed on milkweed, but they feed on the sap of milkweed, of the milkweed stems, of the milkweed follicles, the seed pods. They migrate. They need, they need plants. They need plant sap to live. So they fly to the southern United States to spend the winter. The Red Admiral Butterfly does the same thing. And it'll start to come back in, in May. Um, the males are quite territorial. And I've seen in the Heather Garden, I, I saw one day a male perching on one of the elms, low down over the path of the promenade. And anytime anybody would walk by, he'd chase after you. If a bird would come by, he would chase the bird away. He was clearing the territory to wait for a female to come along. Another bird uh, butterfly that migrates is the painted lady. This is what they look like from above looking down. And this is what they look like from the side. And a lot of the kids may have been raising painted lady butterflies last summer. I think Aya did, my granddaughter, um, but they also migrate. And here's the hoverfly I was telling you about. It's such an important insect. They have an adaptation. They've evolved to look like bees so that predators will leave them alone because nobody wants to get stung. And they are very important pollinators. They're called flower flies. Their babies, their larvae feed on aphids and aphids kill plants by sucking up all the sap that the plant needs. So the, the larvae of the hoverflies or flower flies kill the aphids and eat them. They migrate. Now, here are the insects that stay here year round. The ladybug. Ladybugs will curl up in, in a leaf with each other or alone. They will mass together on a windowsill. If they come inside your apartment or your home and it's very dry there, you know, every once in a while, spray a little water near, near them and they'll survive the winter. That's all they need because they mostly just rest. 
And then once spring comes, they'll fly out and they'll mate and lay eggs and start all over again. The morning cloak butterfly overwinters here. And on a warm winter day, it will come out from under the leaf litter where it's hiding. It can also go inside underneath the bark of trees. But what they do is they fill their bloodstream with sugar water, with glycerol, and it keeps their cells from freezing and crystallizing. And that's how they survive winter. So it's like they have antifreeze in their blood. These are very large butterflies and you'll see them in late winter, or early spring. The hummingbird clearwing moth, we can we see all the time in the garden when we're volunteering there, but they, their caterpillar forms a pupa or chrysalis uh, and that they, they crawl underground and then they form their, their chrysalis, their cocoon there and they live under the soil and then they hatch out as an adult and fly away. So they overwinter as a pupa. Praying mantises mate in the fall, lay their, create their egg case, lay their eggs and die. But in the spring, as soon as it warms up, hundreds of little tiny perfectly formed praying mantises will crawl out of these holes. This is called an oothica or an egg case. And if you're walking around and there isn't snow everywhere, you'll see quite a few of them in the heather garden on the bare shrubs. Praying mantises are, are important because they feed on a lot of the insects that eat the plants. The tiger swallowtail, um, the, the caterpillar builds, builds its cocoon and overwinters inside its chrysalis. The same with the Eastern Black Swallowtail. So one of the volunteers and a person who leads walks in the other garden is Madeline Byrne. And she sent me these pictures. So here is the fennel she's growing in her garden near her house in Westchester. And one, one day, and she's telling me she had a lot of the Eastern Black Swallowtail butterflies eating her fennel. And then one day she looked under her mailbox or her husband did, and noticed something there. Well, it was the chrysalis of the Eastern black swallowtail. And that's where it overwinters. So it's staying in there month after month after month. And then when the weather turns warm, it'll come out a beautiful Eastern black swallowtail butterfly. So they're here all winter, as is the tawny emperor. Now, butterflies and moths have what they call host plants. And these are the leaves that their babies will eat. And so the monarch baby, the monarch caterpillars will only eat milkweed leaves. The tawny, emperor, the tawny emperor caterpillars eat the leaves of hackberry trees. And we have a lot of hackberry trees in our park and you can recognize them because they have these warts on the bark. Well, the, the female lays her eggs on the hackberry leaves and the, and the caterpillars develop. And then in fall, they curl up in a leaf, they curl the leaf up, they attach the leaf stem to the main stem of the branch with a silken thread so it doesn't fall off. So if you see one of these leaves hanging in winter, it means it's probably a hibernaculum or a place where the babies hang out during the winter. The honeybee. We certainly have a lot of honeybees in our park. Um, the honeybee, once fall is approaching, you know, they're social insects and they live in hives of up to 50,000 bees. Most of them are worker bees or females, but come the cold weather, there's still a number of drones or male bees that haven't ever mated. And they are kicked out of the hive because there's not enough stored honey to feed everybody. So the drones are kicked out, the hives are sealed up. <clears throat> excuse me, and all winter long, the female workers surround their queen, and here she is in the middle, and they shiver their wing muscles, and they, each bee turns into a little heater, and they keep the temperature inside the hive at a steady 92 degrees Fahrenheit. So it could be negative five outside, but inside the hive, it's nice and warm. So the bees survive. 
The bumblebee is also a social insect. She doesn't have such a big hive, but in the winter, everyone but the, the, the queen will die back and the queen will start to dig a hole in the ground in the autumn. Um, I don't know if this is gonna work. Probably it's the same problem. Um, You see, she's using her hind legs to dig a hole. And she makes a little burrow for herself and spends the winter there. Sleeping under below, you know, above the frost line, but below the snow and the cold. And then in the spring, she'll come out, she'll mate, she'll lay eggs and start all over again. And she'll live about a year. The carpenter bee is not a social insect, it's a solitary bee. And they are our largest bee, they're also our, a native bee. And you can recognize them because their abdomen has no hair. It's shiny and they're, they're just enormous and they scare people. But they don't, I mean, the males definitely don't sting. The females have a stinger, it's really an ovipositor for laying eggs. I took this picture of the carpenter bee in the, um, in, in the Heather Garden a couple of years ago. But in the, let me just show you this. The carpenter bee is called a carpenter bee because the female will chew a round hole in wood. And then she will go in and tunnel in the wood and she'll roll in a ball of pollen and nectar and put the ball here and then she'll lay an egg. And then she'll build a little partition of wood that she chews up with her mouth. Mouth, And then she'll put in another ball of pollen and nectar and she does it and lay another egg and she does it again and again and again and again. And then she leaves out this hole and the babies develop on their own. And when they become adults, they fly out. But in the winter, she'll go back and she goes in there and she overwinters in this tunnel. To keep track of the time. Um, I'm not going to show this, but I, it'll be up. Um, this man is just talking about the tunnels and how, how a lot of people don't like carpenter bees, but boy, are they amazing insects and important pollinators. Now, I'm showing this map again because it's not only of the, of the migrating birds, and, um, but it shows other animals that migrate, including the fish and horseshoe cramps. So although our park, our park extends along the banks of the Hudson. So I feel like I have to talk about the fish because um, the, uh, we often can see the osprey and lately we've been seeing bald eagles in the park. Um, they fish the Hudson and there are a group of fish called an an anadromous. And anadromous fish spend the winter in the ocean or along the coast. And then in the summer, they come up the Hudson and they mate and they spawn, they lay their eggs, and then they leave again and go back to the ocean or the coast. And one of the fish is the Atlantic sturgeon. They're huge fish. Um, they can be like five, six feet long. They're bottom feeders. And you see they have these barbells and as they swim along, they can touch the bottom of the river and they can feel because their eyesight isn't great. And to tell you the truth, you can't really see much in the Hudson because it's filled with algae and all kinds of particles, which make it a very rich, nutritious body of water for the animals that live there. Another animal that migrates is striped bass. It comes up in the summer, lays its eggs, and then in the winter, it goes back out to the ocean. And the same for the American shad. The Hudson River is teeming with life. And one of the animals that depends on these fish is the osprey. Now, I've seen osprey flying over the park and they are enormous birds. They're, they're about the size of a bald eagle. Um, they're very common and it's easy to identify them because when they fly, they have this kind of M shape to their wings. And they will dive into the water, into the Hudson, grab a fish, fly back out, 
they'll turn the fish around so it's head first to make it more aerodynamic as they fly to a perch to feed on it. By the fall, along with the fish, they're gone. They follow the fish out to the ocean or to the coast. And now the mammals. We have so many mammals. Um, opossum, skunks, eastern gray squirrels, groundhogs, raccoons, and southern flying squirrels. I just can't wait to tell you about them. Now, people are complaining about the squirrels. I know that they become somewhat aggressive in autumn, and it's because their brains actually expand because they're thinking about nuts and they have to gather nuts and they have to cache nuts in the ground. Um, and that they're obsessed and passionate because without those acorns, without all those nuts that they bury, they won't survive the winter. So it's a matter of life or death for them. This is a baby gray squirrel. Now squirrels can be gray, they can be black, they can be brown. It's like whether we have blue eyes or brown eyes or green eyes. Um, they are all Eastern gray squirrels. And this is a cute little squirrel baby. In the spring, well, almost any time of the year, you can see the gray squirrel collecting leaves, running up trees to build her nest. And these gigantic nests in the trees, these gigantic leafy nests are called drays. And most of the year, the squirrels will have her babies in these outdoor nests. Um, the outside is, is rough and it's made of branches and oak leaves, um, but the inside is soft and lined with moss and grasses. And this is where they spend the night. If something happens to the dray, if there's a storm and it blows over, it opens up, the mother will carry her babies. Now when the babies are born, they, are, they can be hairless and blind. Their eyes are still closed, but the mother will carry them to safety to a new den. In the winter, they might den inside a tree cavity where there's more protection. And then there's a flying squirrel. When we have, um, we have a little house up in the Catskills, tiny little A-frame. And we, I used to see flying squirrels up there. We were just so amazed. We would shine our flashlight at night and watch them. Um, and then when I taught in, in Englewood, New Jersey, I had a flying squirrel come into my classroom. Um, so we were all able to see it close up. But when I put the bird feeders up outside our window on Bennett Avenue, um, one night at my cat, Murphy was sitting on the ledge and I saw his tail swishing. And I look at this tiny little squirrel on the bird feeder. These squirrels are four inches. They have this skin that stretches from their front paws to their back paws. I think it's called patangia. That when their arms are open, it's like they have wings and they glide. And I'm gonna show you, I hope this works, if not. But the flying squirrel never hesitates to leap into the void. Luckily, he comes equipped with a built-in parachute. He doesn't make that noise. <laughs> Membrane stretches from wrist to ankle, turning the squirrel into a living, breathing paper airplane. With each leap, the squirrel takes aim and spreads its body into a square. The cartilage rod attached to their wrists helps them steer during flight. The rodents glide through the forest like ghosts their tails acting as a stabilizer and a brake. They may look like daredevils, but flying squirrels have plenty to be scared of. Snakes, owls, raccoons, and even cats constantly hunt them. 
But no matter what, this squirrel will always have an escape plan. Gliding is like a built-in life insurance policy. Wingless predators need not apply. Okay, they're not, even though you said they're like ghosts, they're not ghosts. They're just these adorable little mammals and we're so lucky to have them here. <clears throat> um, I think there's a whole colony around here because people have told me when they're walking their dogs at night on Bennett Avenue, they see them. Um, one guy was walking in a, with his dog and this one flying squirrel came down, gl gl was gliding down, aiming for this little oak tree on Broadway and it, it hit the man in the head, kind of glanced off his head and landed on the tree. So we're very lucky. It's not everybody that gets to see them. And I will show you a picture of our cat Murphy watching the, the squirrels. And Murphy's small, he's a little cat. We have two of them that come. One night over the summer, there were three. Let me get out of here. Okay. Now the woodchuck. Um, the woodchuck is a large rodent in the squirrel family um, that's active from spring through summer through fall. And then it starts to eat and eat and eat and get larger and larger and larger, put on a very thick layer of fat. Um, it digs a burrow, which is, you know, <laughs> the bane of, uh, for all gardeners. Our gar head gardener does not like them, but we do have them in the heather garden. Um, they help mix the soil and aerate the soil. And then they go into their burrow and they go into a deep winter sleep where their temperature drops to just above freezing, 37 degrees Fahrenheit. They take a breath every three or four minutes and they sleep for months on end. Their burrow becomes a home for so many other kinds of animals, raccoons, skunks, opossums, bunnies, um, chipmunks, um, worms. Uh, most of these animals, like the raccoon and the skunk and the opossum, they don't hibernate, but on really cold days like today or stormy days like today, they may go in there just to get out of the cold. The skunk. So when we moved up here, from the Upper West Side, um, one of the first things we did was have dinner at the New Leaf Cafe out in the terrace, the good old days. And we were having dinner and all of a sudden we heard people clapping and then they'd stop. And then another group would clap. And I look and every time they were clapping, it was because a skunk had entered the terrace and the people that were dining there knew that all they had to do was clap and the waiters clap and the skunk would leave. The skunk kept trying to come in, kept trying and trying and finally it left. But they, uh, they have poor eyesight and they walk along snuffling on the ground, looking for food, looking for insects, looking for grubs, looking for anything they can find because they're omnivores. So if you see a skunk, if you lightly stamp your feet or clap your hands and let them know they're there, that you're there, they will walk away. They don't want an encounter with you. And they are beautiful animals. Um, they're active in the winter. On warmer winter days, they'll come out of their burrow, which is often the woodchuck burrow, uh, to find food underground. And in the spring, they come out with their babies who are adorable. <laughs> the possum. The possum is our only marsupial. Marsupial is a very ancient animal that has a pouch, just like a kangaroo or a koala. But the opossum is our only North American marsupial. So here is the pouch of of an opossum and here her babies are pretty big. So they're starting to poke out. But when the babies are first born and they might have 14 to 20 babies, they, they're like the size of tiny jelly beans and they can get 14 baby opossum into a teaspoon. That's how small they are. And after they're born, they climb up to the mother's pouch. They climb in the pouch 
and they start to nurse. And then once they're big enough and they can't fit in there anymore, they climb onto her back where they stay while she teaches them how to find food, how to escape predators. And they are nocturnal. This is our last animal. Raccoons are here year round. They also have to bulk up for winter. Here one is eating rose hips, which are the fruit of roses. And they become huge in winter. But on a day like today, they might be in, inside someone, some woodchuck burrow or in, in a big cavity inside a tree, sleeping away, not enjoying the snow like we are today. So that's my talk. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Let's see here. Um, I'm going to leave this up. I am going to stop share. Oh, you're all still there. <laughs> Good. Okay, so Jennifer. Can you go back to that last slide for a second, Leslie? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you want me to share again? Yeah, just the last slide. Okay. All right, can we can we give a round of applause for our wonderful Leslie Day? Thank you. Um, how fortunate are we that she knows our beloved park so intimately and has such a deep appreciation for it um, and is willing to share her knowledge uh, with all of us. Um, it's really wonderful. And you had the most soothing presentation voice, Leslie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I feel you. like I'm almost in, you know, in, in this complete state <laughs> of peace and calm and that I'm <laughs> connected to the natural realm, even though oh, I'm, I'm that's so nice to hear. Um, well, so I don't know what I'd do without, without you in this park. So thank you. Um, yes, this park is, it, is what lured you to live on land, right? Yes. That's yes. That's why we moved here. Exactly. I too moved to the neighborhood after one walk through this park. I just had it every day. So I think we all share a deep love uh, for Fort Trayon Park. Um, so I just wanted to give a, a plug. Um, the Fort Trayon Park Trust does have other uh, online resources, some of them uh, that we've partnered with uh, Leslie Day on. I'm gonna put uh, the link in the chat. Um, on the Fort Tryon Park Trust website. Um, and if you wanna help us expand the, uh, park pro the programming we do, um, make a donation to the Fort Tryon Park Trust. We always uh, aim to make all of our programs free and available to the public um, so that they're a resource. We wanna educate and inspire uh, everyone equally. Can I say something here? Of course. Um, I have never known anyone to run a park the way you do, where you have all these educational opportunities and uh, hire so many of us to, to share our knowledge and our passion. So we're just so lucky to have that. I mean, all my years living in Riverside Park, there was nothing like this. Now, it's really unique and so special. Thank you. Oh, sure. Well, we, you know, Fortran Park is our front yard, our backyard. It's also our natural classroom. I mean, as you said, we've got such an abundance of fauna and, and flora here. Um, we really want everyone to have that deeper appreciation because it results in better park stewardship because people recognize what an incredible uh, asset it is. Fort Tryon Park is in its 86th year. Um, and Jennifer, maybe you could mute everybody. So I'm hearing uh, some feedback. I'm not, Sean Foles, the Fort Tryon Park Trust Development Communications Manager is on. I think she has the power to do that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to encourage everyone, help us expand the amount of free programming we can offer. Um, our park is 86 years old now. And as you might notice, as you're walking around, some of its infrastructure is aging and needs some extra help. And the city, unfortunately, is in a budget crisis. Already, the Parks Department has had a 14% reduction to their budget, an $84 million cut so far. So if you can, uh, give a gift to FortTrainParkTrust.org 
slash donate or help us grow the giving by encouraging others to, to give. Um, so some questions that came up, Leslie, is are the, are the hawks um, that people are seeing in the park a mating pair? Yes, they stay together for life. Okay. And, and if one dies, then they will find another mate, but they are a mated pair. Great. And, so, and, and um, pale male, the first red-tailed hawk to build a nest on a human-made building is now 20 something years old. Um, and he's still fathering babies. I mean, he's had many mates because so many of his mates have died from eating poison rats or been hit by cars, um, but they can live a long time and they, they stay together. Wow. Wasn't Lola? one of pale males partners yes yes <laughs> um people have requested an update on the wounded red tail hawk that the ranger saved the other day i've reached out to them i haven't gotten an update um but we'll post it on the fort Tryon park trust facebook page uh when we get it so uh look look there for an update um so many, so really enjoyed this. Thank you, we learned so much. These are some of the comments, uh, Leslie. Fantastic, love knowing more about our neighborhood. Someone asks, is it bad for us to bring bird seed to the birds in the winter? Well, in the park, unfortunately, it is against Department of Health regulations and you can get a fine. Um, we also, because we're trying to protect the hawks, we don't, use, we don't use the rat bait. Uh, so we've got a lot of cat feeding. We've got a lot of bird feeding. We have a lot of squirrel feeding. Uh, one of the byproducts of that is you also then end up having uh, extra rats, uh, which uh, most of us uh, don't appreciate. So the park rules are you aren't supposed to feed the animals uh, because we have so many berries, uh, trees, uh, different types of uh, flora, um, uh, park rules are not to, not to feed the animals. Um, thanks, more to look for. I've, someone writes to you, Leslie, this was wonderful. I've seen only some of these animals, but having seen your presentation, I'll know what to look for. Thank you so much. Great. Um, we do, Leslie is, uh, the Fortran Trust also hired Leslie to do these wonderful short videos on some of the trees in Fort Tryon Park. You can see those on, uh, they're released on uh, social media, the Fort Tryon Park Trust Facebook page and I believe Instagram as well. And then after they're released, they're put up on the Fort Tryon Park Trust website. We've got a section, it's called visit, and you can look at the um, natural history talks and tours. So we've got resources we want you to keep learning and appreciating. Um, and uh, there's history, botanical tours that you can take advantage of. I'll put the, the full link in um, uh, the chat. So I see a question about owls. Um, <clears throat> oh, you can see the chat. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing the questions. Um, okay. So owls are hard to find because they're active at night. Um, and the ones that are known, so I know that there's a screech owl in Inwood Hill Park, but they keep the location secret because owls are so sensitive. They don't want a lot of people bothering the owls and the owls will leave. Um, but there is also a snowy owl right now in Central Park. And I think yesterday, when was, maybe it was Friday, or maybe it was yesterday, it was at the reservoir sitting on top of the pump station. And so a lot of people are going there if you want to see an owl. Um, there's one in Central Park. Look up snowy owl, go to uh, New York City eBird, and you'll see where that is. Um, Oh, the window feeder, yes. So um, we're on the fifth floor, but I've seen articles about people who are up on 
the 90th floor who have a bird feeder and birds go there. So bir when birds migrate, they fly very high. So there really is no limit as long as it's within the atmosphere where they can get oxygen. Um, the, the bird, that bird feeder is really nice. It's pricey. I know it's like $170, but it doesn't hang out. So you can't get fined for it. Um, and it's inside, it comes inside your room. So it's a little bit of protection for the animals in winter. Oh, a woodchuck in Morningside Park, good. I think it is normal. I just think, you know, Morningside Park and Inwood Hill Park and Fort Triumph Park are on, on a hillside. And so um, there's all kinds of rocks and areas to make dens. Maybe, maybe that's uh, what it is. Maybe that's why they're in Morningside Park. We never saw them in Riverside. Okay. What happens to the male bees that are kicked out because there is not enough room for them? <laughs> Let me tell you, um, they don't survive. Male, male bees are drones, they're, they're reason for living. Their one job is to mate with a nearby queen. Once they mate, they die. And those that don't die, uh, live another day to find a mate again. But if by the autumn they haven't died already, then they're, they're kicked out and they die of thirst, they die of starvation, they die of cold. It's quite horrible. I mean, it's not an easy life <laughs> for a male bee, but um, there just isn't enough. It just, there isn't enough honey that's stored. They have to use that honey all winter long. Um, Many robins stay over the winter, and has this changed over time? Yes, it, it, it's definitely changed over time. I and mean, when I was growing up in the 50s, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, I didn't see robins. and They were a harbinger of spring. Um, but now we often do see robins. And some people say, well, it's the robins that are in New England come down here for the winter, but they don't know for sure. A lot of robin, a lot of rob, most robins probably do migrate. Leslie, is that your bird we're hearing? Right now, I think you're hearing my heat pipes. Oh. <laughs> I love the sound of heat pipes. <laughs> um, but Buddy is quiet right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there's a comment. We see lots of robins in Castle Village. That's wonderful. Oh, good. Who's here from Castle Village? Good. Okay, well. Any other questions? Thank you all for sticking around so long. Does it increase the danger of birds flying into the glass with the window bird feeder? You mean the kind of bird feeder I have in there? Um, or do you mean, I'm not sure what kind of bird feeder you mean, I think that birds fly into glass when they when the glass reflects the sky and they think they're flying straight through air. I don't think the bird a bird feeder in front of a window is a danger for them. I think they'll come in that it's it's an object that they can land on. So no, I don't think so. Um Thank Somebody you. wants to become a volunteer in the park. We have volunteer days uh, pretty much every month. Um, you can go on to the fortryandparktrust.org and click on volunteer to submit, or you can just send me an email info at fortryandparktrust.org. January Stewardship Day was canceled because we got that frostbite warning. Um, but we may be having one later this month if uh, the forecasted temperatures are, are lower. But we love we love volunteers. They help us keep the park going, and they model stewardship to other people, which is contagious, and helps ultimately in how pe people's treatment of the park and how they use it with respect. So, uh, and it also obviously helps us extend the level of care we can provide for the park. So, we have someone watching from Brussels. Isn't that cool? Uh -oh. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone.
What a joy. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. This was great. Hey, Judy. <laughs> Thank you. Stay warm and enjoy the park. It'll Stay be safe. absolutely gorgeous tomorrow, but icy. So please take care. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Sean. Where's Sean? I don't see her. Sean is running the meeting. Ah. She's the Hi, Sean. <laughs> technical behind the scenes orchestrator. Thank you for me too. <laughs> Hi. Enjoy the white stuff. Yeah, I like your picture, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, I'm sure you recognized it. Take care. Uh, you Thank too. You. I have a good evening. <laughs>